Awesome. Well, just wanted to welcome everybody. I'm very excited to uh, have this workshop today and uh, to just welcome you. Um, I'm Justin Dellinger. I'm at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, we have uh, Dr. George Siemens also from UT Arlington and uh, University of South Australia, Florence Gabriel from University of South Australia, uh, Pete Smith from UT Arlington. Uh, we have Anna Movides, another panelist from uh, at Georgetown University, Vladimir Kovanovic from UniSA, also Ryan Baker from UPenn, and um, Shane Dawson from UniSA as well. So um, we have a, a good group of, of, of organizers and uh, panelists today. We're really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you um, about this project that we've been working on for about two years now. Um, George is going to share a little bit more about that. Um, Ryan might chime in too. I know he's going in back and forth between two sessions here tonight, but um, that play that came out of the genesis of uh, Ryan's uh, idea about was it January or no, I think it was December of uh, 2018. Um, so, uh, slide here. Okay, so for our agenda, um, we're going to be probably rough with this one, just at least want to give some time estimates, but essentially uh, we'll get uh, kicked off here, um, give some, uh, some opportunities for people to introduce yourselves. Um, George is gonna walk us through, again, the uh, background as well as maybe some of the resources that we have. Um, we'll do the panel discussion, um, then we'll take a break. And then after that, we'll do a brainstorming session that uh, Flo is going to uh, facilitate. So. That'll be it again. We'll uh, probably wrap up a little bit on the earlier side, not necessarily go the full the full three hours. Um, but if we do, <laughs> then that means we're having some really productive, great conversations, which we look forward to. So in terms of resources, I uh, just wanted to point you to these. If you're not aware of them, uh, we have learninganalytics.net, LALN. That's our main website. Um, I don't know if George is going to share these uh, at all, but uh, our Twitter handle, uh, LearningLA. And um, we also have a resource hub. Um, we're hosting it through the University of Texas at Arlington right now um, as a place where uh, we can uh, store and share resources, uh, videos, things like that. Um, and then our workshop page, again, as I mentioned, um, after the event, we will, we will post the recording as well as um, any other resources that we generate there. Um, so I want to take a minute here and uh, let everybody uh, of the attendees uh, introduce yourself. I'm just curious. Um, your institution organization role and maybe kind of what you're wanting to get out of the session. So um, perhaps uh, we'll start with, um, let's see, set off. Is your name right? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sadaf. I'm a PhD student at Monash University, just completed my confirmation milestone. Um, I'm also a primary school teacher. Uh, um, by profession. So I have a lot of interest in EDM in LA. I've attended uh, Ryan's um, MOOC, uh, but all my knowledge about learning analytics and EDM is theoretical from papers and readings that I've done. Uh, so I'm keen to understand um, the, the issues that there are so that I can maximize what I do from my research. What I'm looking at doing um, super quickly is looking at the data really closely, the diverse range of data within primary schools, and focus on improving uh, mathematics learning from factors within that data. Awesome. So that's that's about me. Thank you. Sounds great. Welcome, uh, Ben. You're next on my screen. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Ben Hicks, and I work at Charles Sturt University, which is a large regional university, sort of doing learning analytics in support of our retention and student support programs. And um, I'm also uh, a PhD candidate with uh, UTS looking at uh, complexity in learning analytics. My background's mathematics originally, spent 10 years in high school classrooms um, and uh, probably only sort of really got stuck into the learning analytics community over the last couple of years. Um, I'm not sure what I'm trying to get out of the session, but I'm very interested. <laughs> yeah. We're so glad to have you. All right, uh, Kathy. Sure. Um, I'm Kathy. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. 
Um, and my, I'm also doing research for the City University of New York. Um, my interests are around affordable access and success for students who are traditionally underserved by higher education. And my dissertation research is looking at the use of multiple modalities in, <clears throat> excuse me, to improve student learning of course content for non-traditional students in online courses that are using an adaptive learning system. Um, and I'm also doing research around uh, issues of time poverty with City University of New York uh, for online students. Awesome. What would I like to get out of this session? Well, I, first I want to apologize that I'm probably not going to be able to stay till the end of the session. Um, I attended the AERA conference this past week, and so this is my <laughs> what uh seventh seventh day i think or six six or seven six sixth day of conferencing anyway um and i have some other things i need to take care of tonight um so i do apologize that i won't be able to stay for the whole thing but i did want to uh participate anyway despite that because um i wanted to try to connect to folks um and i had seen uh some of the the sessions that you guys were doing with the network around equity issues. And that was really interesting to me. And I wanted to learn more because um, I have not been connected to it yet, but it seems like something that aligns well with my interests. And so I'm here to try to get connected in a little bit more than I have been. Awesome, great to have you. And yeah, we'll definitely continue to have events. I um, invite you to see like, Twitter and others um, like I'm posting them also. Definitely please join us in the future. We'll have some great conversations. Um, Ahmad? Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ahmad, and I'm a postdoctoral student. My full name is Sayed Ahmad Rahimi, so you can call me Ahmad. I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Florida State University. I work with Dr. Valerie Shu and Brian Baker and Sidney DeMello on uh, a project for about like uh, three years. Um, and I'm the uh, incoming faculty member in the University of Florida. Uh, I will start my uh, assistant professor position from June. And generally, I like the topic of learning analytics and educational data mining. It's a, a great interest of mine. Uh, with Val, I've been working on uh, a topic called the stealth assessment, which I think these two can go hand in hand together and create uh, a very uh, good learning experience for the students in game-based learning environments. So I'm here to learn wherever Ryan Baker is. I'm interested to be there. So and others, of course. Awesome, good to have you. Uh, Enrique. Hello, my name is Enrique Montemayor. Uh, I work at Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. Uh, and in my department, we do, uh, we manage all the key performance indicators and we do models to understand and give insight about these uh, KPIs. And uh, we have also a uh, learning outcome, a KPI is about learning outcomes. And I would like to know uh, how learning analytics, uh, how I can use learning analytics to give uh, recommendation, insights to the, to the leaders of the institution to, about these uh, KPIs. Is it, uh, is it Melchor? <clears throat> Melchor. Melchor. Uh, hi, uh, Melchor Sanchez. Um, I am a pediatrician, a physician, a pediatrician, and I have a master's and PhD in health professions education. I am a professor of education at the National University of Mexico in Mexico City. And uh, I was in charge of the area of educational assessment and educational innovation in the, for the whole university until the start of the pandemic last year when the president of the university made some organizational changes and he, he created a, um, a new area that merged the area of uh, distance education and the area of educational assessment and educational innovation. And that's my, my task. So I, I, I want to try to coordinate a concerted effort at the university to get started on the learning analytics train. I think we are a little bit late to the, uh, I hope the train hasn't left the, left the station yet. But I mean, we have more than 360,000 students, more than 40,000 faculty. And we have all these data lying around to be analyzed. Awesome. So, and I will to, to get to 
all of you, get to know all of you and network a little bit. Thank sure. you. Um, Mr. Matthias? I heard pronouncement right. Um, is it Matthias? Uh, it's uh, Matthias, but you Matthias. can can call me okay. Matthew. It would be okay. okay. So um, I'm Matthias, PhD student from the Learning Technologies Research Group at the RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Um, my PhD focus is on collaboration research with the large multi-touch tabletop displays. Um, but beyond that, we are interested in traditional learning management systems and learning analytics, for example, in our Moodle system and VR environments and, uh, and in general in multimodal learning analytics. This is what we are looking at at the moment. And yeah, I'm uh, very excited to, to get all of you known a little better in this workshop. Awesome, and thanks for joining us so early in the morning or late at night or however you want to think of it. <laughs> Uh, Felix. Very good morning. I'm Felix Sarikaraj. I work as an assistant professor uh, in the National Institute of Technical Teachers Training and Research, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, India. And uh, right now the time is uh, 4.45 uh, in the morning, early morning. And uh, uh, I'm interested to uh, join you uh, in this webinar. And my uh, research area is on uh, teacher training, how to have a uh, MOOC effectiveness and uh, how better to improve the uh, teacher's evaluation and uh, application of uh, various components that will enhance the MOOC effectiveness for the students' learning. And uh, thanks for uh, this workshop. Awesome, great to have you. Thanks again for coming so early. Um, all right. Well, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to George now, and uh, he's going to give us a little bit of an introduction about um, LALN and kind of what we've been about. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Justin, and uh, thanks all. Um, just want to give a quick shout out. I think we, you know, there's a few others on on the call here. You know, we've got uh, well, Vidimer was. A, I don't think he did an intro, but. Um, you know, I'll be, you'll hear from him soon, Shane and Ryan, I think, as you mentioned, Justin, Ryan will be sort of in and out, um, and Shane likely will as well, and, and obviously you and Florence are leading this particular thing. I should give a little bit of background on how we got here. So it was a number of years ago that uh, Ryan approached uh, Justin and I around putting an NSF grant in to basically try and take advantage of the fact that there's many regional learning analytics groups that are doing learning analytics work in different parts. At that point, we were US focused, but around the country. And it's reflective of, I think, a broader interest in learning analytics that we see really just in, in all levels of academia. And it was just recognizing that how, there's an opportunity, if you will, to collect some of that energy a little more centrally and provide light touch governance to help amplify the effectiveness of these regional groups. So that was the early motivation. And we submitted an NSF proposal to that effect, which unfortunately was not funded. But by the same account, I think, uh, you know, generated some interest in what this might be or look like. Now, from there, I was having a chat with Shane Dawson, who uh, is on as well about, well, you know, maybe this is something that we could do regardless, because it's a useful project. And maybe the opportunities that exist could help us as uh, you know, individuals do a better job of connecting globally. And so we uh, felt at that point through the Center for Change and Complexity and Learning, C3L, uh, at uh, University of South Australia, uh, that that might be something to devote some time and effort and resources in. And so as a result, we approached Florence, who uh, was interested as well in sort of helping to lead the initiative, and then Justin from UTA's side. And so essentially, the what we now see with Learning Analytics Learning Network is led by uh, Florence and Justin. So I want to talk a little bit, though, about one of the mindsets that I think is imbued in the learning analytics community in general and in the entire sort of movement, if you will, that we have globally. So early on, the emphasis we've always had is that, you know, the, the field itself of using data as a way to improve our understanding of teaching and learning 
and using that data as a way of conducting research into those kinds of processes was a field that if we invest in it in some ways through time and effort centrally, it's the typical rising tide lifts all boats. And as a result, we had a number of sort of white paper-ish documents. There's one that we did through the Society for Learning Analytics Research around open learning analytics. There was a project that uh, Shane and I together with Grace did uh, that looked at uh, you know, how to deal with learning analytics at a, a state level and by state mean country level. And I know some parts of that uh, actually influenced uh, Pete Smith when he started developing his, uh, the, the current uh, university analytics group that he leads out of UTA. And, and the whole mindset that we had was with a light touch bit of central coordination, uh, we create opportunities for professorships, we create opportunities for doctorates, we create opportunities to have an impact that has a positive effect on education. Our motivation was not at all tied to uh, you know, trying to corral or corner any part of this field or domain, if you will. And we had, and I think still largely do, a strong egalitarian mindset. And that mindset basically says, if we all contribute what we're doing, it's going to improve the quality and the impact of the entire field. And if you look at it now, you know, 11, 12 years later, the number of professorships that are available, the number of, you know, entry level assistant prof positions that are available that have a learning analytics, educational data mining focus are significant. Um, by the same account through UTA, um, just launched the Master of Science in Learning Analytics, which is the first uh, Master of Science that's fully online in this area, and the list goes on. So the emphasis then is we can, given how significantly the world has digitized over the last year, there's going to be growing need for expertise in analytics, and there's going to be growing need for people who can teach and who can do the analysis work. So we want both the researchers and the practitioners in this space. So that egalitarian mindset within the early learning analytics community is sort of the ethos that also drives what we're trying to do here with the Learning Analytics Learning Network. The intention is to say, and, and this came from sort of Ryan's early vision, is you've got all these groups that are doing learning work within different regions. And they're helping, say, profs who have never seen R how to figure out sort of basic analysis work, or they have some you know, new analysis techniques that these young punks are engaged in, and they want to stay current in that area. So you know, sort of reskilling, if you will. Then you have others who uh, may be new to entering our field, and they want any level from entry to intermediate to advanced topics of interest. And so if you look at the URL, and I'm not, or up to the previous events, and I'm not sure Justin or Florence, if either of you have it handy, I can grab it in a minute if you don't, um, you'll see that we've run over the last 18 months, a combination of, I think, very informative events that are primarily intended to do what Learning Analytics was, was started to do, which was create a space where people can become exceptional practitioners and exceptional researchers. So the events that have been hosted, you'll see if you look at them, have a range of topic areas that include basic entry-level analysis work, that include concerns about how do we ensure that bias and, and other sort of negative or harmful effects of an analytics can be addressed. How do we give support to people who are entering the field? How do we ensure that people are getting research and learning opportunities that reflect the cutting edge of the learning analytics domain in general? So that's a long way to say that's the intention of Learning Analytics Learning Network. Our goal or motivation is to be a support to learning analytics researchers specifically. We want to be a community of ongoing learning and development. And that's the mindset that we've largely engaged in in trying to pull this together. Uh, on that note, um, I want to say you know, particular thank you, obviously, to um, you know, Shane and uh, crew at UniSA for uh, the, the time and resource allocation that Florence has committed to this, uh, UTA, Pete, and others for comparable contribution with Justin's Young Life. And obviously, uh, you know, Ryan for shaping the idea initially, and then Florence and Justin for, for running with it. And I think having, if you look at the, the events held already, there's a significant resource there. And I'm hoping as more schools run learning analytics courses or eventually run uh, master's degrees or offer profess or um, PhD programs, that they're going to start to find that as a valuable use 
to promote the quality of the field as a whole. On that note, I will throw it back to Florence and Justin and just once again say a quick thank you to everyone that's joined us today. Awesome, I just wanted to see, uh, did anybody have any questions about uh, what we talked about so far before we move to our next section? Okay, I think that is a no. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll transition to our panel discussion. So uh, we have um, again, three great uh, discussions here. Uh, we're really excited to have them uh, participate. Um, we've run a number of different sessions between the three of them and, and we're excited to learn a little bit more, uh, you know, hear a bit about their expertise and about the sessions that they've run and, and some of the challenges and some of the opportunities in particular. So, um, Pete, how about I start with you um, and then we'll go, uh, Yana and then Vita, we'll go to you. Um, you just give a brief uh, introduction about your background, your current role and your expertise. Yes, I am uh, Pete Smith at the University of Texas at Arlington, a, a colleague of uh, George and Justin and many of you globally, uh, in part because of uh, initiatives like this. Uh, I serve in two roles at the university. I serve as the chief analytics officer, which was actually a new role which was created in 2015, as George noted, uh, very much influenced by the work of Solar and others um, as we thought about how our university might come to uh, the, the data that was lying around, as, as one of our colleagues uh, said. Uh, I also serve as a professor of modern languages, so not too surprisingly, uh, you'll hear in a few moments that both of my sessions had to do with language data, unstructured data, and how uh, researchers and practitioners can make use of that, that data flavor as well. Yeah. Sorry. Um, my name is Yana Bobidis. I'm uh, from Georgetown University. I am faculty in our Learning Design and Technology program, which is a program we started um, now we're in our fourth year. Um, and I am director for learning design in our Center for uh, New Designs and Learning and Scholarship, so Georgetown's teaching center. And we've been doing, um, it's a very integrated center and a lot of what we're doing with um, the learning design technology program and our students in relation to LALN is tied also to CANDLES, which is the acronym we, and the name we use for our center. So I'll talk more about that, but I, my background is in instructional design and technology and um, uh, focused on computer-based instruction. Look forward to chatting. Thank you. Awesome. Vita. Hello, everyone. So my name is Vita Mirkovanovic. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of South Australia, uh, working in School of Education and uh, Education Futures, now called nowadays. Uh, and yeah, uh, my background is in learning analytics. I've been involved for the past eight, nine years. And um, yeah, uh, I've been part of this network and uh, had we, we gave a, one presentation uh, on what was that a year ago or so. Um, and uh, the, the goal was really to push to um, for schools to, to, to see how we can support practitioners in school levels. So many of the things we do in learning analytics is primarily focused on higher education, and we are seeing how we can move towards other areas where we can have more impact. Okay. Awesome. Well, since you started talking about that, Vita, um, let's go to the uh, next question. So just about your event, um, what led you to, to do that work? And then could you talk a little bit about why you picked the audience and the level and the type of session and that kind of thing? So me or somebody else? <laughs> I'm sorry, say it again. Should should I, should I go or somebody? Are we yes. Gonna go to... No, I was saying okay. since you since you already started talking about your session. Yeah. Bit, so think. so yeah, we we, I mean, in many cases universities do have resources to do learning analytics, and that that's great. Like we have our all of the in infrastructures and 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 um, university support when we do our work, but um, um, you know it's still localized to one institution, and uh, you know doing with some other. Um, areas such as you know working with government and with public schools and so on there's a great great potential for impact there so that's why we want to focus more on that and uh, our audience was uh, practitioners from school levels so that's how we organize our session we 
uh, advertised it um, through our channels in, in Adelaide. And we get about, I don't remember correctly, but about 30 participants, something like that, 25, 30, who are from all from, from different local schools. And a uh, few of them were actually online as well, I remember. And um, yeah, that was the, the topic, really. That's why, because I guess for the first 10 years, we were focusing on our own business. Now let's move to other places. Yeah, and you had one of the only uh, in-person sessions that we had, although we did do the recording. <laughs> uh, Pete, um, we'll move to you because you had the second <laughs> in-person session, February 28th of 2020, before things changed. Uh, but then one of the last the things I did. Yes, and you had a second event that was online, though. So Jack, talk again about the topic, the audience uh, type of session, and why you chose the, to do that work. And we actually had the honor to be part of two sessions. The first one right at, right at the end of February uh, 2020. And when I say we, it was actually a team here at UTA. Uh, I was joined by Henry Anderson, who is a data scientist and known to, I think, many in the, in the LAC community as well. And Elizabeth Powers, our research coordinator, as well as Justin assisting with our sessions as well. Um, our session in February and our session later in the fall were both dedicated to uh, qualitative data, use of unstructured or language data in the educational setting. I believe both were aimed at essentially the beginner level or introductory level, uh, simply because we tended to find more interest from individuals who had been working in the quantitative side of things who wanted to also uh, move over into qualitative. And of course, uh, George Siemens implored me to uh, teach more about language and culture since those were uh, personal interests of his um, as well. Um, we had smaller groups. Um, uh, we had, I, I think it's fair to say, uh, groups that were for the most part true beginners, really thinking for the first time about some of the language data, word data they may have had in their uh, particular settings. And although we did offer theory in both, we were very tools oriented as a result. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those sessions, but, but truly beginner sessions, um, I, I think in both cases. Yeah, and we had a pretty uh, big, broad audience, especially in that first one, ranging from community yeah. members that just had an interest. To I, had, I had forgotten, actually, we did that in person as well, didn't we? Um, at the Link Lab site, as, as I said, that may be one of the last events, public events we did on campus, yeah. Period, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, Jana, you've uh, had, uh, I guess, technically three, because you had one in March of 2020 uh, that I know you moved. I think it was supposed to be in person to move online. I believe, and then you've had two um, in the fall and they're about to have another one next week. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. Um, so we took a, a, a different approach, I think, uh, from maybe some other uh, schools. Um, uh, we, from the very beginning, um, it, because we were tying it to our efforts around the program, the, math, the master's program in learning design technology, we had one course we were offering as part of that program that's a core course that's on learning analytics. One course is not, doesn't do it justice. Uh, so a lot of what we, we do is really, uh, we introduce um, the, the learning analytics topic to our students. But as part of every core course, the way we've designed the program is to have a, what we call applied innovation projects. So basically, real world projects with clients um, so that our students understand both the, the doing and, and, and what they're learning, but in relation to the constraints that they're gonna be operating in when they graduate. So it's kind of, um, anyhow. And so we introduced this applied innovation projects. We introduced LALNDC as a concept, as a project. Um, into that course and we had the students actually think about the vision, where should this go in, in the, the DC chapter of LALN? Um, how do we reach the broader community? In the, at, at, the, at that point, we were all thinking, everybody was coming on campus, right? So we were thinking in person, in the classroom kind of space. Um, and then when we realized we, couldn't bring people together in an event. 
the students had to adjust and, and change the design. So we were tying a lot of our initial efforts around what does community mean in an online space? Uh, how do we engage people in the conversations around um, the ethical uh, questions and issues related to social justice and learning analytics? So Georgetown uh, and our program attracts um, uh, students who are very much interested and very active in the social justice um, space. And um, that is kind of a thematic um, space that we're operating in at this point. So we did, we switched to an online um, environment. We did a synchronous session initially. Then we had also uh, a network, a synchronous network. Uh, we were posting things. So we kind of tried to, to bridge the synchronous asynchronous um, divide. Um, and then as part of that course, the idea was to use that data, um, the activity that was happening within the platforms, the data that uh, what uh, people were, how they were designing the synchronous session to be able to present a report as to how are people connecting in the network or starting to connect in the network. Um, and so they presented that at the end of the semester. Since then, we realized that one way to sustain it, should I continue or should I pause and then come back? I'll continue, okay. One way to sustain it, you're muted, Justin, so. That's okay, I thought you could read my lips, you know. <laughs> anyway, yes, go ahead. Um, so, one way to sustain it. So this was all designed by the students. So I was serving more as a faculty advisor to them. So I was the client because I was working with Justin and he gave us the charge of the LALN um, group. And we said, okay, well, here's the one pager we have, you know, what do we do? So it was very much a figuring things out, which made some students uncomfortable, but it actually gave them an opportunity to also think about how to co-design and co-create with a faculty member and, and break down, start breaking down the barriers that, that we have in the classroom. So that was what I really enjoyed as part of that effort. But with that in mind, then we thought one way to sustain it, because I think we all are tight on resources, um, is to really have a LALN DC chapter fellow or ambassador as part of our graduate program so that they're serving um, to identify topics, they're bringing, you know, they're helping organize these events and workshops that we're doing and, and are very active and are learning from the experience and are getting embedded within the community and the network. And we, are, we started with one of our graduate students who graduated in, um, last semester and Aaron, and we brainstormed together and thought, you know, one way to talk about social justice, equity, social change in relation to learning and learning analytics is to really have a conversation with people. And so the, after that initial um, event, we've, we hosted two, conversations uh, this past semester. And the next one next week is the third conversation. So we're continuing with that same theme, learning analytics um, and social change, and are building from the previous conversation. So we, we are thinking of it as a continuous um, discussion, an ongoing discussion. Um, we're changing a little bit the format, uh, but I'll talk about that when we come to the lessons learned, Justin. Sounds great. Um, so Pete, let's go to you next. Um, so what are some things that you felt went really well? I know you did an in-person and an online session. Um, things that went well, and then maybe some things that you didn't think, uh, you wished gone a little, maybe a little bit better. Well, for, fortunately, from the lessons I think some of the first speakers learned, we were we were saved by some of Justin's good planning. I, I uh, Yana, I have to say how impressed I am by your very integrative approach uh, to this with students and classwork and, and student groups. 
ours derived from slightly different directions. The first session really grew out of a MOOC uh, that we offered back in 2018 that laid out some basics of NLP and natural language understanding, really as an effort just to continue broad discussions in our community and on campus about NLP, NLU. Um, I, in fact, until Justin mentioned it, had forgotten that I actually stood up and delivered that live in Link Lab, although some of the participants were online uh, from, from the before times. Um, I thought the physical presence, uh, as, as several of our speakers have mentioned, played a real key role, and members of the community. There was, in fact, as I recall, a parent with several of her uh, children who had come after school, we did it late in the afternoon, who wanted to come and expose both herself and, and, and her children to some of what we were talking about and thinking about at the university. It was quite an honor to talk to them and, and really involve them in the discussion. The, the second piece that we did later in the year really derived out of our undergraduate courses in the Department of Modern Languages. We are really trying to move our students toward more machine learning based uh, tools. They do a lot of work with machine translation, which is uh, AI essentially. And so we brought some of that knowledge and some of that curriculum into the LALN, but then we're able to integrate it back into the classroom. Uh, those students see some of the special activities that we developed specifically for the LALN sessions. Uh, the organizational piece that Justin provided that I think saved us in both cases was think beyond presentation. Both of our sessions began with a good 40, 45 minute lecture because that's what I do and I'm very familiar with that and have been for decades, but we really designed hands-on work into the second half of each of the sessions and that benefited the sessions both on campus and online. Um, but then in each of the cases, those were activities that could be brought back into the MOOC. Uh, I've subsequently used the first activity in some conference settings, the Student Success Conference uh, out at USF, for example, the following year. And as I said, my undergraduate students are taking some of the hands-on on work that we designed specifically for these sessions back into the, the curriculum at UTA. So um, hands-on applied work uh, that I think benefits uh, multiple constituents on our campus. Awesome, and uh, Vita, um, just going with the on-campus part again, um, and I know that since you're working with people in the community as well, um, what are some things that you felt went really well with your session and uh, some things that maybe struggled a little bit more? So the session went, Okay, could have been a bit, I guess, better uh, in terms of could have been more interactive. So that was the one thing that we kind of made a mistake because uh, we were expecting there will be more interactive, but the problem is it was still very new to everybody. So that's why it wasn't so much. So that was our miscalculation at the start. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that will take time to develop. And uh, for many people, the first time they ever heard for the term learning analytics, and then you try to do something interactive <laughs> and you get stares. So that's, uh, th that's been the only thing that was um, a bit problematic. Other than that, it was quite good. We, we, we you know, exchanged contact with many of the people who, who came back to us saying they, they want to start working in this, this area. So we built up on some of those connections as well. Uh, so that was that was good. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, that would be my 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 take. Good. Yeah, the, the networking part of it is something we want to continue to develop. I think it's it's definitely something that could be a great strength of the network. I mean, it's connection with the community and it's, it's, you know, love the work you all are doing in the K-12 space in particular and it's definitely something I have an interest in going forward. My dissertation was on that, so. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's exciting. And, and yeah, one thing I, I love about yours, obviously the, the graduate students, you know, leading it too. And this is one thing I love in this session too, about how many uh, students that we have in, in this as well. And I think this is some great opportunities around that. So um, I'd love to hear some of the things that you felt have gone well and, and perhaps not quite so well. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the challenges that, you know, when we're looking around um, the learning analytics space and the expertise that is out there, one of the key questions that we asked ourselves, um, wh what can our graduate students, you know, how do they get comfortable also being part of this space? Because it can be overwhelming if you are talking with experts in, in, in educational data mining and 
you know, the, the, the language, the, the connections we're making could be, you know, we could be talking like this. So one of the things that really they, we spend a lot of time at the beginning is spending um, time actually thinking about what is the, what's the end of the, what does this community look like? If we were to move from a network where a bunch of people are interested in joining one, but we all know when you join one session, you're excited, but then you go back to your, your work and you prioritize your work. And then unless there's really something that will draw you back into that space, you're likely to go the first time and then drop off. Um, so, so we spend quite a bit of time, especially with the students um, initially in the, in the course, kind of mapping out what does, what does success look like for, for this as a community? Um, and then we, so then the initial, the kickoff, let's say for the network was meant to be um, the kickoff of this longer term development of a community. So, and I think that, that the idea there is to tie design and, and learning design, and in this case, more developmental, because um, to form a community, we all know, it takes a time and, and different ways of engaging. And to tie that to data and, and to tie that to what does um, a platform, what can a platform tell us? What can the data from a platform tell us about how we're, people are connecting? Um, can, can we go just from clicks? No. Uh, so therefore, we need to look at what the people are saying. Therefore, what kind of skills do we need there? So a lot of the discussion was really getting them to understand the data from a system, because our students also are not coming, they're, they're coming from many different disciplines, actually, into the program. And, and that really worked well for us as a, as a group. Um, I think when we when the pandemic happened and we had to go online, I, I could sense lots of disappointment from the, the students because they were eager to bring people together and to do what what I think at Georgetown we we value more is that in person experience. Um, but we they did switch. Um, so, oh, so I think. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Continue. I think it was just a mic. Turn oh, okay. So, so what we learned is that we also were agile enough to pivot. So I was offering lab sessions outside of the class uh, schedule uh, every Saturday morning. So I told them I'd be there in the lab. You come and you work on different things. I'm there to provide support and advice. And we switched that to a Zoom lab and but we still met every Saturday morning until we, we geared up um, the, the work picking the platform you know the research that went into well which network do we pick we ended up going with mighty network um, which then students realized oh they could get some nice dashboard it has a really nice dashboard of participation data they have an algorithm they're measuring engagement but they couldn't download any of the data and as a faculty member, I, you know, do, how much do you let go? So I let it go because they need to also run into that kind of problem and figure out what to do. So those things, there was a lot of learning, I think, that took place from both the students in understanding the nuance of, of what do you do in this space when you're talking about learning and you want data informed um, decisions. Um, and then also uh, there was a lot of growth on that uh, on the student side and a lot of growth on the faculty side because um, co-creating with students means letting go <laughs> and um, which means potentially course evals not being you know stellar but uh, you know working within a, <laughs> a space where I 
we could fail was actually an important part of why I even took this on. I can see why in other spaces I, I wouldn't really be even have the opportunity to do the co-creation with students. So, and I think what we learned later on is that there's a lot of prep that happens, even if you are not the one moderating or facilitating a virtual session, um, working with the graduate students to get there meant that they really needed to understand how to design for a Zoom space. And so I spend a lot of time helping our students uh, understand what it takes to run a synchronous session. And to so they were learning many skills along the way and learning how to, to appreciate, I think, learning analytics as a field. It was awesome. tough. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a useful skill to develop this day and age. <laughs> And uh, yeah, someone that's been trying to build a network in, in mind, yeah, when COVID happened, wow. I mean, as envisioning all these in-person sessions at UTA, being sort of a hub sort of between Dallas and Fort Worth and wow, <laughs> amazing how much that, uh, that changed things and the connections to the people that, that I was hoping to, to bring in, definitely a challenge. So kudos to you for, for me to keep it going in the online setting, I'm hoping that start get a little, a little bit back uh, to normal. That's definitely something that that we we've been wanting to do with LALN is is to have two components, and that's like this the, the, the on campus or community presence, um, local, but also you know the virtual synchronous, but also an asynchronous component as well. Yeah. Um, so you know going forward, um, you know, we can I showed the resource hub link. You know, we we've been wanting to develop resources that people can use. Um, and whether you, know, if you can't join a session because we're you know, international global network, you know, here it's, it's, it's a, it's a challenge to make these sessions and, you know, with people here for, you know, 445 in the morning, one in the morning, that sort of thing. And that's, that's great. No, that's not necessarily realistic all the time, um, too. So finding ways that we can, um, support, you know, others, um, even, even if they can't attend our session live is yeah. important. So, um, so go ahead. Just to respond to that, and as you can see from our web page, we pulled that together <laughs> for that event with the idea that we would be updating it um, as we went. But you know, um, resources ended up being what they were, and we um, the semester ended. So now part of what we're doing is that the current Madeline, who's serving as our current student ambassador for LA and NBC is drafting, you know, what does the position of a student ambassador look like? And part of it will be updating the website and, and doing all of those things. So, it, you know, it takes a while to, to get going, um, but I think doing it in a, in a way where it gives the students the opportunity to also showcase who they are um, we also have, you know, recognized them on our programs website, um, and I, I think it's also, um, it, I think they're recognizing the value, um, and they have the freedom to to move it forward, which is valuable, I think, invaluable. I agree. So, um, thinking about sessions we want to lead going forward, um, Pete. Um, come back to you. Um, where do you interest in? I know we've talked about Bert and other sessions, but uh, do you have any, any particular thoughts for where you'd like to see uh, the DFW LAN and UTA uh, group go? Sorry. Hi, I was uh, really struck today by the global uh, nature of what we're doing. And I think I had that in the back of my mind as we were doing our sessions and thinking, uh, but I would certainly say today that you know our, our discussion, even just in these first few minutes have driven home for me. I knew we had a group of asynchronous learners in Germany. I don't know if they were in, in Aachen or not, but um, um, I remember thinking, you know, certainly we were gonna have some reach in that regard. Um, and, and I would say, you know, one of our questions earlier may have been, you know, what didn't work so well? Um, in our first session, we tried to send some of the local participants out uh, to make use of two tools uh, that, that are very widely used in NLP, right? We tried to actually give them some test data and have them play with both Luke and Co-Metrics. I have to say on site that really just did not 
work very well. Uh, we didn't have the time. We didn't really have the infrastructure to do that. Um, and but I did hear that some of our asynchronous groups around the world had the time and the planning and, and that activity worked a little bit better in that setting. Um, we have been thinking about a third session, but you know, I think following the workshop today, one of the things I might think about is bringing this notion of NLP and the notion of multilinguality to it that many of us, and there are also sessions here at LAC uh, that are talking about data collection across multiple languages. Now, what are some ways to deal with multilingual data sets that please do not involve Google Translate, that just causes me to grind my teeth at night. Um, and, and provide some ways for researchers to think about uh, the truly global nature of what we do and the true multilingual, multicultural nature of how we collect data and what are some ways we could, we could think about that data as researchers. So that if I had to predict a topic we might work toward in the next few months, I think that would draw on both our experience and some of our uh, discussions today and, and, and the conference this week. It sounds good. We'll work towards my having your energy. It's bad. I know George has been asking me to talk more about language and culture. Did I mention that? Yeah, what about you? I'm actually you're running the session next week. Um, do you see some other future topics or just continue the conversation? Um, are you asking me? Sorry, Justin. Yes, yes. That's oh, fine. sorry. Future session. Um, I think um, so. We we're doing something a little bit different in this third conversation. It is around um, still thematically um, trying to tie the practice, uh, um, uh, learning design practice and learning analytics together um, and thinking about the, uh, how we make ethical decisions uh, and, and also thinking about the broader scope of social change. So that is still the theme, but uh, we, um, Madeline is going to basically have, uh, run it as an interview. We have a graduate student from our um, data science program at Georgetown uh, who will be part of that panel. Um, I, we invited uh, Ryan Watkins. He's a professor in educational um, leadership, mostly educational technology leadership program at uh, George Washington University. And um, so he's going to talk from, and they recently started a PhD program that um, is focused more on collaboration, but very data focused. Um, and then we also have our director for assessment at Candles, who will also be part of the panel. And uh, hopefully the three perspectives will make it a rich conversation around what does um, uh, Mindy think about when she's thinking assessment data at a university? Uh, what does the student, graduate student, um, what are they getting out of the program and what are they thinking about? And then what does a faculty member who is, you know, been in the field for a long time and has been doing learning design needs assessments and all of that think about where we're going? So, and I think um, language and culture are dear to my heart. I grew up in Cyprus, um, born and raised there. And I think we all appreciate the, the global perspective. Um, and I think there's also opportunity with other organizations outside of learning on Legends and Solar. Um, AECT has lots of, at least on the, on the learning design side, I, I work with an international group with uh, which we're a group where we're looking at culture and instructional design and online learning. And we have a group that is trying to identify research projects. So that might be an interesting um, intersection, Pete. Um, we can talk offline later. I'm typing notes and I hope George is listening carefully to the importance <laughs> of language and culture. So um, UniSA has been doing some, some great work lately. Uh, we had uh, Fernando last month. Uh, we had Apollardo uh, talk about uh, feedback and contest in particular back in, in February. And I know that we have uh, Chen and Hazel and Srechko doing some sessions in June, July on uh, ethics and privacy and, and that work. 
Um, Vita, was there um, anything that you saw, particularly maybe even in the K-12 space, um, follow-up sessions that we didn't see out of your group? So I didn't hear the, the, the most important. Have you seen, can you repeat? Oh, I'm sorry. I just was saying, um, I know that you've had some great work um, out of UNSA, again, Abelardo and Fernando, Chen, Hazel, and, and Stretchko um, in the spring and summer. I was curious, is, was there anything on your end that, that you saw as a, as a potential thing coming up? Oh, yeah. It? yeah. Yeah, so, well, we're currently working with schools on a project learner profiles, man. we are really looking into how we can develop some analytics for school to help their decision making and, and their teaching. So uh, we got what, some seed funding from, a, from a, one of the foundations and working with schools to four schools at the moment to build, uh, to first see what kind of data, to do a data audit, to see what kind of data they have what are they collecting and how that data can be used to support some of their um, organizational goals and strategies. So typically schools will have certain say, in the next uh, period, we wanna focus on student well-being. Okay, what data do you collect on that? How are you gonna see that? Can you build certain something that will help you uh, in, that, in that process? So that's really the, the, the idea. And yeah, definitely. I mean, I, we really see that the change many, and. Uh, not just that, uh, also the other push by the, from the government and from the other sides uh, for uh, developing capabilities, monitoring their progressions of learning and so on. And, and even some of those government reports were, you, were mentioning uh, that there is a need to better use data. So yeah, definitely. Absolutely, it's, it's on, in Texas and yeah, having more virtual schools and the amount of data that we've had collected this year and I've, I've definitely seen some interesting conversations around you know, how to use the data better in the K-12 setting, um, you know, getting away from the uh, high level, particularly the high stakes test data and trying to get more granular and the challenges that come from that. Awesome. Um, so uh, I have one, one final question for the panelists and then I'll open it up for Q&A and then we'll take a break after that. So just the last one is um, in terms of running an event, do you have any other um, recommendations for someone running an in-person event or an online event? And I'll just open up whoever would like to chime in out of the three. So I know you've already shared some thoughts, but I was curious if you had anything else. More is less, or less is more. One of the two. Uh, I think that the challenge is, you know, going into it and wanting to do this much and realizing, no, you got to do this much. So I, I think that's the, the biggest learning outcome from on the student side was that. Um, learning to narrow things into down and getting um, dealing with time management issues. <laughs> I would add, um, move away from a presentation mindset. I've, it's been very interesting for me to hear today that how richly these sessions have been conceived. Uh, we really had to get mostly me out of the presentation mindset and more into an integrated you know, workshop style format. Um, and also don't be afraid to have fun when you do that as is clear from, from all of us, I think speaking today. Uh, the second session we did where I didn't have so many slides and I didn't talk for so long. Um, we actually used, uh, we, we trained a machine learning model with, with some unstructured data, but it was uh, the Simpsons characters data set where we had, we trained the model on 50 or 60,000 lines from the Simpsons. And we trained the model to determine whether a line was spoken by Homer or not uh, from the Simpsons. And we literally had people in the crowd shouting out, you know, does this quote that includes the word donuts come from, from Homer's mouth or not? Uh, many of the quotes that he, he uh, is associated with uh, uh, do have donuts in them, but not all. There are other characters who talk about donuts. And so all of a sudden we're talking about cartoon characters and humor and donuts. And I have to think by the end of that session, we were, uh, we had both a good time and, and tackled machine learning with language data. Anything on your end, Vita? It, it's hard. I mean, th th there's definitely a, a, a lot of potential for, for expanding the the, the current uh, the current development, but uh, it, you know, it's all of that takes time. That's mm -hmm. that's the main part. So, uh, on our end, what we noticed is that uh, 
it's about a lot of other developing capacity and takes you about, well, some of the reports from US talk about five to seven years to develop capacity. So in, in terms of the, the digital data and the, the shift or mindset of shifting to, to use of digital data. So that's where, where uh, our current struggle, I guess, is. It's, it's one thing to have people at, well, the university level, it's hard, but at least some who know the value of data and how to use that. Rather, we have a you know, shift in, um, in school space where people didn't want to come to be teachers to have this kind of evidence-based approach to teaching and so on. And uh, so they're not driven by the data, right? They're not researchers. People who are into uh, teaching are not so, don't come for the same thing as we do as researchers, right? Absolutely. So um, this is it. one of the biggest things with learning analytics, learning analytics learning network is you know, this idea of regional hubs and, you know, we, we value the, the new nodes that we, we can see potentially joining uh, the network, whether it's, you know, sometimes we, we've had some one-off presentations, but we love being able to see a series of events that's coming out of an area. Again, when you have particular um, skill sets and again, like Pete, you know, with, with NLP NLU or, or learning design with Yana or, or just the great work that I know UniSA and Vita um, are, are doing in the learning analytics field. Um, yeah, there's, you know, we, we have different strengths and capacities. So, you know, we can amplify each other's work. So we know that there are plenty of other partners and, and we'd love to identify more. And that's being part of it is, is, is what we hope to draw out in Florence's session um, at, at, the, at the end after we take our break. And we definitely want to learn more about that. But um, if you're thinking about running an event like this, this is a great opportunity to pick, uh, pick people's brains while we're all here. And um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and open up the floor. And if you just want to um, turn on your mic and ask a question, uh, please feel free to do so. You guys were just that good. <laughs> I might ask a quick question. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, I just turned my video on. Um, so I'm quite interested in uh, what uh, is, is it? Vomi? How do I correctly pronounce it? Is it Vitomir? Vitomir. Vitomir. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Vitomir says I'm looking at doing uh, something on the lines of what you've been talking about. Uh, at primary school level, so looking at data, um, because there's so much of data and such different type of data. Um, and as you said, as primary school teachers, we don't have the um, often um, the training to be able to use it all the time. Uh, I was wondering, have you, is there any work being done with primary schools so far? And um, is there somewhere where we could read up a bit more about it? Uh, well, we we just started uh, maybe two months ago, so we don't have. Uh, you know, well, we have we'll have a, one paper under review that's about uh, teachers' perception about use of analytics. But uh, um, in terms of, uh, there's been a lot of work actually in, in KTL space, and uh, mm -hmm. actually when I was looking, we, we uh, there will be also soon a special issue in Journal of Learning Analytics that we co-edited about. Um, learning analytics in um, primary and secondary school. However, there already been a lot of work. So when we were looking for people for potential reviewers for those papers, I actually went to a LAC20 uh, easy chair and looked up who, who tagged their papers as with K to 12. So because I was looking like, okay, who's doing, it would be very easy for me, the easiest way to find. Uh, there have been over 40 submissions on that just last year. There was just like one thing that maybe doesn't show up so easily if you just look at the titles because people would say predictive model of, uh, I don't know, student well-being. You don't have a clue. Is it about K-12 or is or it's not? And uh, so that's why it's, it's almost in many cases, there have been a lot that uh, people have been doing that. And, uh, but there are definitely more and more. One area that's a bit initial one was when people will bring their stuff to school. So we will build some cool 
new toy, shiny new ta tabletop or something. Uh, and we go to the schools, we work with them, we go back to our lab, and then we analyze the data. So that's, uh, that's the easiest, right? You're still in control of everything. Uh, but there are more and more of, of um, school-wide deployment. I know, for example, in uh, Latin America, they did uh, uh, as well, there have been some projects with LALA, Learning Analytics in Latin America Network. They did some evaluation, both in higher ed, in K-12, um, adoption of analytics, for example. And yeah. Thanks, Vinesh. Yeah, just to add on to that, I'd, I'd love to see some more stuff out there in terms of just that general um, helping the data reverse um, in, in adopting learning analytics, particularly we may end up looking at some student facing and how do you um, help students as well as the teachers um, sort of build their capacity to, to in, in, engage with it in a meaningful way. Just to add to that, I, I like that um, what you just said, because one of the things that we, even in higher ed, even if it's not primary, one of the things we, we did um, learn even in higher ed is that students don't know what, what they leave as data in, and as they engage with the platforms. And we don't necessarily we as in instructors may not even know either. Um, and so, and, and I, for me, one of the things that I uh, want to talk about maybe even with even K-12, which is I think a bigger challenge because of age and, uh, and is the idea of using, uh, having our students as products um, and vendors and, and the way that they're coming into the ed tech space and product, basically we're using, our students are becoming products instead of being um, students and, and learning and they don't even know it. So love the, the direction you're going with that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, well, uh, a, a question and a reflection. Uh, well, two questions. Uh, because I tried to register for the LALA uh, thing, but it's it seems to be closed. I don't know if later you can give me some pointers about who to contact to establish for, uh, formal, uh, I mean, contact and collaborations with them. Uh, and um, because I find that there's very little, uh, there are very few publications in Spanish about the subject, and it's a uh, huge issue when I know that English is the language of science, but when you can talk, you want to convince a lot of Spanish speaking teachers and uh, uh, people that are in charge of uh, education, they usually want uh, papers published in their native language. So I don't know if later you can also point me to some key papers in Spanish. And speaking of natural language processing, I've heard about a lot about that, but I also would like to be uh, to have some suggestion about uh, tools for natural language processing in Spanish, because it's, uh, I mean, it's a language that horrible students and uh, teachers use. And um, I, I've always been a big fan of these data information, knowledge, wisdom continuum, where there's a lot of data, but it, human beings do not internalize it. It doesn't become information or knowledge, etc. And I, I want, there's so much data and now with the pandemic that everybody's online all day, uh, I assume that uh, the increase in the volume of data in all, <laughs> uh, all over the world has increased greatly in the, in the past year. But I wonder if um, there are some formal rigorous case reports of, of success of using learning analytics in terms of increasing the whole function of this educational system, you see, because there are a lot of research papers with a lot of the basics and a lot of, uh, I mean, very deep papers, 
And when you try to see case reports that actually show change at the national level or at university level, that's not so easy to find. And I have a hard time convincing people here in my university because I, I am a physician. So uh, computer science and uh, high-end statistics are beyond my comprehension. But uh, I have a lot of scientists in the university, mathematicians, computer scientists, etc. And I would like to get them together. And it's very difficult because the people in my university that are very focused on education, most of them are in the social science or pedagogical areas, and they do not want to quantify learning. They, they hate it. They say learning is something so deep and precious that you cannot put numbers to it. So it's a large um, tension and conflicts of uh, paradigms. So I wonder if you could give me some pointers or suggestions about that. Thank Definitely you. contact Lala Network people because if you look at their link, actually, you know, aside English, right? Uh, Spanish has by far the, the strongest community. So, uh, and they're, they're, they have the contact. I mean, Pedro uh, Munez Merino, he's, he's the, in charge of contact, with, but there are other people and uh, um, person at Solar Exact, um, Isabel Hillinger, he's, she's also. Uh, part of the Lala network. So they, they have a lot of, when you just go to the Lala project website, you will see, I don't know, 50 uh, uh, affiliate universities there. And um, so, yeah, there have been resources in that space, uh, you know, more than others. And I will, I will add about NLP. I would be delighted to reach out and have a conversation about NLP in Spanish. I will tell you, this is a huge source of uh, discussion and I would say almost embarrassment in the computational linguistic community that 95% of our work and research is happening in English. Um, and so we as a community are really thinking about the diversity of languages and cultures in which we all work and that doing research in English alone in NLP is no longer acceptable uh, in any way, shape or form. So I would love to continue that discussion with you and in the computational linguistics community, I can point you to some, some work that's happening in Spanish in particular. Thank you. Awesome. Well, uh, we are up against our time. So what we'll do is we're going to take a 15 minute break here, but I just want to thank our panelists once again for, for joining us. So awesome. We really appreciate your, uh, your thoughts, your experiences and um, resources that, that you shared and you're definitely welcome to stay. I uh, understand if you need to go, but uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break. I'll set a timer. Um, we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you for staying here with us. <laughs> Um, before starting the, the brainstorming session, I just wanted to uh, talk about the question that Matthias threw in the, in the discussion forum, because I think it's a very interesting one. Uh, Matthias, do you just want to ask the group and, um, and then I'll just open the floor and, and see if everybody wants to. Yeah, I can do. Uh, in, in the previous discussion, uh, most of you mentioned that there's so much data to analyze and what are the questions to ask that data? Uh, and uh, this irritated me somehow because here in Germany, uh, we, we have the GDPR policy and uh, we don't have that much data, especially if it comes to schools. Um, is this no issue for you? And now during the pandemic, you could think, uh, okay, there's a lot of distance learning, but I felt that there was a massive increase in parents, teachers, and uh, politics, which just uh, said, oh, data privacy uh, privacy is more important than ever. And uh, we, we didn't really profit from, from this possibility. Yeah, GDPR is uh, mainly um, policies uh, on what data is protected and uh, how companies and uh, public institutions have to handle data and everything has to be anonymized and schools are treated uh, differently as a special protected environment and uh, yeah, you, you can't save any data on students where there is the slightest possibility that you 
can possibly identify which pupil did what. So is it is it okay to use the data internally in the school or is it just the blockage is just for research or is it just still a mess? Yeah, I, I think the teachers in school would be able to, to use data, but um, yeah, it, it becomes a problem as soon as you, you save the data outside of the school. So if we have a university server where the data is stored, uh, it's already a problem. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I can see in the chat that um, Phoenix is saying that in India, it's also difficult to, to get educational um, data. So, and quantity data is an issue for everyone, absolutely. Um, Vita, do you just want to share a bit about the Australian um, context? Because you're working with K-12 schools and is it much different from Europe or India? Is it difficult for you to collect data or is it quite trivial? Well, um... One thing that's a bit uh, complicated here is uh, that uh, every state um, in Australia is running their own independent educational system and they just have something called Australian curriculum framework, which is <clears throat> like a broad set of things that should be taught and then every state implements them their own way. And that's covering years uh, you know, from, from um, one to 10. And then there are the last two are like a high school degree. They're done by another organization, you know, administrative bodies, again, on each state level. So uh, that, that, that complicates things a lot. Plus there's a public school sector and there's a massive Catholic school sector and independent school sector. Uh, unlike other countries in Australia, a quarter of students don't go to public school. You know, you have private schools everywhere, like, you know, Eton College and so on, but that's, you know, hundredth of a percent, you know, going to things like that. So there's, you know, polit kids of politicians and diplomats go to those kind of schools. But here it, it's, uh, it's far more common to have uh, children going to, to private schools. And, um, you know, the, the way that, the, you know, historical reasons in Australia. So that, that complicates things a lot because you need to contact, for example, we are now in this project that we are working on in the learner profile project, we have to have three ethics, ethics by UniSA, ethics by department, then ethics by uh, Catholic education. So because they're running different, plus each school, private school will then do their own ethics uh, clearance. So that, that, that complicates things considerably. Um, so I, I, I would say uh, that's one thing. Plus, I mean, obviously data sharing is always tricky. And uh, especially when you're dealing with other parts of the world, because now you're talking about different laws, what, what can be done, what cannot, and so on. So those things are quite challenging. And uh, yeah, we had one, GDPR was one example when we had problem. A company from Netherlands, they had some software, whatever. They basically didn't want to share this. They, when they said, well, if you buy our software, we won't be able to share the student data with you because we are working under GDPR. I'm like. <laughs> That's very easy. We're not going to buy your software then because uh, uh, I really don't care about your GDPR basically uh, because uh, that's, that's not our uh, policy framework that we work against. So, not, you know, if you want to operate in Australian market, well, you know, do something about it. I, I, I really don't, uh, you know, we don't want additional constraints of the European Union on, on top of our own mess that we have. So, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's pretty challenging, I would say, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing. So yeah, Matthias, just to give you an overview of yeah, what it's like in different countries, it's again, not necessarily easy either, but maybe less um, complicated with the, than with the GDPR. Um, anybody else would like to contribute to this discussion? I, I well, the, the, the there's, yeah. the thing is that there is all this, uh, it's amazing, at least in Mexico, there is this uh, discordance between the law and what actually happens in the real world. So, the, I mean, there is a lot of protection of data and every day you see 
a lot of data exposure from many people and organizations and nothing happens in terms of, of punishment or applying the law. So I was just wondering, and I put in the chat that if educational data, data shouldn't be part of the whole process, like I am a physician and I need to obtain patient's data to make a diagnosis and a treatment, shouldn't in education, <laughs> I mean, this data be part of the process and not have to jump through a lot of loopholes or, I mean, obstacles to obtain those data. And, because in the end, the data, is, if the rational use of the data is supposed to help <laughs> the students, I mean, that that's why we do it. It's not just to, uh, to gossip or something like that. Well, just a thought. There's a tension between the fiduciary responsibility of an institution, you know, like institution of higher education, and the you know the research side of it. Though I think you know like the internal processes and things that you can do. I mean, as a faculty member, I can get the data from my class. At least sometimes <laughs> depends on the project, I guess. But uh, but in theory, I should be able to get access to my data and be able to to, to use that to improve the, the learning experience and improve the design of my course and things like that, right? But um, at the same time, yeah, being able to conduct the research sometimes as you run into those ethics barriers through when they're based on the institutional review board. Um, yeah, definitely, you, you have some headaches with that, but at the same time, I, mean, I went to the uh, responsible learning analytics workshop yesterday. I mean, there's some important conversations that are going on in this space and you know, ethics and justice and care are, are at the forefront and you just hear it more and more right now, um, particularly, I mean, al <laughs> algorithm has become a dirty word. <laughs> I right know, and <laughs> so um, you know, but it, but at the same time, I mean, there's obviously a lot of great potential. And there's a reason why this uh, this conference is growing too. So um, it's it's negotiating that, that that pathway. I think is, is is a bit of a challenge. So right now, we're still we're still at that point with tension. And when you do a, a learning analytics project in the United States, you have to go through the. IRB approval process, like if it was a research project, or, or how does the ethical, I mean, supervision of your projects uh, applies? Uh, yes, I mean, if I want to do research, phone up, do a publication presentation at a conference like LAC, yes, I, I typically have to go through an IRB to be able to do that. Now, if I'm doing secondary data analysis, maybe not so much, um, it's a de identified data set. Um, but if I'm doing active data collection with human subjects, yes, typically. Um, but if it's, like I said, if it's a, something just for my class and I'm trying to use some data and inform, you know, my, my class right now, typically at a, the institutions, I don't see a lot of like opt in or even opt out with students. And most of the data is, is collected and can be used um, at most of the institutions that I've seen. And so um, we, do, we do collect those, tend to have big data lakes and access to that. Sometimes you have learning analytics dashboards and work like the University of Michigan is doing. And they have you know, some really fantastic products. Others, you know, less so. But, um, yeah. I, I think I can add to the other side of the fence for Vitami because I've worked in a pretty data-intensive high school in Australia and sort of within the school, like it's really shared and promoted, um, but it's as soon as you try and push outside of that little microcosm, it, you, you, it doesn't go anywhere. And it, it, is a, it is, makes it really hard to make broader scale decisions. But in terms of like your duty of care of like a teacher knowing the students, you've got everything there. But it's looking for broader patterns that you just really run into difficulty. We had some conversation with one of the local high school. I mean, some of the things is, for example, the Department of Education w would run certain survey Teachers at the school won't get the, the result. They will get the average for the school. And, you know, I mean, yeah, it's useful, but, you know, it's much better as, as you know, mentioning that treating them as almost like as doctor, like, you know, give them this data, right? That, that's the data they need. So don't, don't give them, imagine it's like saying, you know, well, you know, uh, in a clinic, well, survival rate of your patients is this much on average. Well, that doesn't help much. I mean, you know, I would much rather have for each individual to see you to learn something from it, right? So, I mean, it, it's better than, and then the, the other thing is, for example, in Catholic education space, they're also running certain annual surveys on well being and so on. They don't share the data at all with individual schools. There's also power play, 
in many ways they're also power play. Uh, they run, the, the, the centralized Catholic education office is doing that for themselves to better understand. They don't do it so much for the improvement of teaching and learning. So they also almost would like to keep certain data for them to be in a better position over bargaining with schools. So there is also politics involved and other things. So, uh, but yeah, and I, I get some, some of the data schools definitely share within and, and, uh, and use and a lot of the reports and other things, but there's much to be desired, I guess. Well, thank you so much everyone for sharing. I think this is a brilliant discussion and, and I think that's really linked to, to the essence of what the learning and analytics learning network can be in that networking opportunity and that mean of sharing our knowledge and also our different cultural experiences and how we deal with data in different countries. Um, I'd like to uh, jump into the brainstorming session. So in this session, we really wanna explore how the learning analytics learning network can best address the, the needs of the LAC community. So you, uh, we really want to hear from you regarding the types of events, the types of organizational strategies and the related networking activities that you would find valuable. Um, so as you know, our activities both serve as an introduction to learning analytics to new members, such as students or teachers, and also as continuing education for existing members of the research workforce to make sure that we keep up with the rapid changes in the field. We now have more than 25 nodes in the network, which is great and it keeps expanding. And we have run 15 events since the end of 2019 and Vitamir um, was a pioneer and just launched the first event of the network. So thanks again for that. Um, and we've seen really the number of attendees to these events grow um, and grow. So that's really good. And we want to keep building on this momentum and, and hear from you. Um, as you've heard, we, we've made the recordings and the materials accessible. They're all available on our website, in our resource hub. Um, it's getting very stormy here. <laughs> Sorry if there's a bit of background noise. Um, and, so after reflecting on what the Learning Analytics Learning Network has done so far with, with the panelists, we want to understand how we can best support our community and how we can keep growing and getting better. So how can we move forward? Um, we first want to reflect on what we've done so far. So uh, I think Justin shared with you a document with the previous events that we have run and the upcoming events too. Um, you can also obviously find that information on, on the website. And so I, I wanna start this session by asking you to provide some feedback on the, session, on the sessions we've run so far. So do you find the sessions interesting? Do you think the audiences are appropriate? And also, are you likely to go back to review any prior materials? Are you likely to engage with that resource hub? And if so, which ones, which sessions do you find interesting personally? So that's my first question to you. Yeah, Justin just now uh, put the, the link to the website. Thank you for that. So as you can see, there's, there's a wide variety of topics and we've heard before that there's been um, questions about equity um, and there's been sessions about NLP or general introduction to learning and analytics. So do you think you will go back to these sessions, watch them, try the, the exercises that were attached to them with the workshops? I see, um, Kathy, yeah. So you're likely to uh, go back to the equity oriented sessions. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, it'd be great to see you there next week too. Yeah, I'd definitely look at the participatory design and that. 
an open science one, research practices. There's a few there I'll definitely check out. Cool, thank you. Awesome, I know JP is running another session at some point. Okay, go ahead, Peter. Uh, one thing I would, I would just maybe suggest is to have better promote, maybe slightly more intensive promotion of the events, given the goal of the network, right? So um, just one suggestion, I'm going to put in a link. The Solar is running <clears throat> monthly newsletter, and they receive submissions. So if you have any event like this, like, well, you do have the list of upcoming events, but for the rest as well, if you have anything... I mean, people be monitoring and adding certain things that are useful to others, but, uh, you know, um, send there. So that will be, there is a form to send your, uh, your item and people will then include that in the next issue of the newsletter. And it's about 4,000 people who read that. So, I mean, obviously not everybody will attend and given the time zones and everything, but, you know, help spread the word. Yeah, we recently got in cooperation status with solar um I, I took care of that so we got that at the end of january so yes that's something we need to start tapping into more so thanks for sharing that um and yeah i, I definitely try to cross promote people's events that i know that i've shared some of the work nyu is doing try to share solars as well mm -hmm. so we're definitely trying to build those networks and and it's not just our our sessions but you know other great sessions that are going on yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you for that. And yeah, definitely collaborating with Sonar is uh, something we're working on in, with other networks too. So yeah, we definitely want to get more traction and I guess pro promotion is a big part of that. Um, um, Melter, uh, just, just so you know, so that, that site is, um, we host that through UPR Arlington. It's basically the Canvas website. Um, we are trying to think of the best way to have a space where we could potentially have interaction taking place. And with, again, we didn't get the NSF funding that we wanted. So we felt, you know, use the resources that we have at our institution. Um, so that's why we have that course. Um, basically what it is, it's a, it's a shell, course shell and in, in Canvas, but it's not run as a course. Um, it's basically, it's a, it's a hub of resources. So anything that's on the website is also mirrored there, but um, you know, it's it can be quite a bit to um, have resources um, and, and you know, especially gigabytes worth of data. Um, so we're using the um, learning management system essentially as, as a place to be able to store videos, um, large resources, things like that. So um, we tend to have those kind of resources there. If it's a link, I, I do use YouTube as well. Um, yeah, George, it's a good good thought. I mean, I have my back and forth on teams. <laughs> um about if it's something that's that, that's useful i sometimes have frustration with it but i, I agree we we, we we we're definitely open to it i know simon mentioned this too at one point um possibly changing whatever format that is i know yana had mentioned there, there's some other collaboration tools that we could use um again part of it's about funding part of it's <laughs> that's just you know i'm as the main person that's updating all these things trying to trying to use what we have available but going forward yes we would love to find ways to better um, facilitate um you know opportunities to network with each other and to have discussions around events particularly asynchronous discussions um that can take place so you know you're attending a ryan baker's session on algorithmic bias but, but you can't go but you want to be able to talk to him and you don't have his email address or whatever you, you have an opportunity to ping him there and then you know you could have some, some other type of people might have similar questions as well get some opportunity for, for some greater conversations beyond the events themselves which is you know i think something that we haven't done quite as well yet um, or you know much at all i'd say that, that those conversations outside beyond when we do sort of regular party meetings um, i think that's that's kind of where we tend to have that no definitely that's something we talked about with ryan too how, how we can improve those asynchronous discussions and these worldwide networking opportunities. So George, I think, you know what, MS Teams might be a really good option and that's something we should um, we should explore. So thanks for that suggestion. Um, I'd also like to get from you what, what do you think is currently missing? Uh, a brilliant suggestion indeed, George, of course. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because you're my boss. <laughs> um, 
So uh, I just want to get a sense from you. What, what do you think is currently missing from the Learning and Analytics Learning Network? What, what other topics would you like to see included and what are the gaps uh, maybe you can identify? And obviously, please come up with solutions too. Don't just identify gaps, but try to um, suggest some ideas. Um, I mean, I'd love to hear about uh, learning analytics um, adoption successes and failures and what people think worked or didn't work. Because I know that's something I'm sort of interested in, in getting right in terms of once you've done all the hard work, how, how do you get the buy-in? And and I, I feel like it's often really contextually de dependent. Like there's usually a story why it worked or didn't, but it's, it's really dependent on where what's happened. I think getting something something like that together would be interesting. Uh, brilliant. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, I guess you're absolutely right. It is context dependent, but then you can learn from different contexts and see what could work in your own, right? So hmm. that, that, that would be a great session, I think. Anybody else, what would you like to learn about? Very good morning. Uh, I would like to learn about uh, uh, how teachers are getting uh, uh, updated on uh, the data literacy skills. How, uh, as a teacher trainer, I would be more interested in uh, helping teachers to understand uh, a basic dashboard of LA so that they can take uh, proactive interventions and uh, uh, they can uh, uh, change and adapt accordingly and uh, uh, create a more viable uh, learning environment. Thank you. Thank you, Phoenix, um, and good morning to you too. I know it's early where you are. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess a, a good starting point could be uh, for you to go back to Vitamir's session because it was an introduction to learning analytics uh, designed for teachers in the K-12 space. So I think that could be a good starting point, but we could definitely run more sessions um, geared towards teachers and see how we can help them develop these data literacy skills. Thank you. Um, one further suggestion from, from my side is um, it's a learning network and I think it should help new researchers to, to come into this domain, especially when it comes to data collection. There are so many topics on open science, open data at the moment, and one important part of this is uh, data standards. And we went for experience API at our institution and well, uh, I had to do the groundwork for, for my colleagues and the team, and there's so many resources which uh, don't really target uh, researchers in uh, open research projects. Uh, it's more like you want to adopt Experience API in your operation and in, in your internal learning processes. And I would love to, um, yeah, create some, some resources uh, for, for new researchers on which data standards are out there and how to decide for one and uh, where where should you look at uh, if you get started in that, that domain. Oh, great suggestion. Uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I guess it can be a bit overwhelming when you're starting in this field and where do you start? So getting a few points is like that could be really helpful. Um, Okay, yeah, that, that sounds great, thank you. So if I may. Uh, of course. Uh, so what, coming from a, a very, I've been on and off um, part of, like looked at solar website and the publications and all of that, but not completely aware of it. So there might be these things that are already happening, but what I'd, I would benefit from personally uh, and what I'd like to engage with is when as you go through your research or as you're trying to apply analytics within the school settings <clears throat> to be able to approach to have groups or approach people uh, when you get stuck or when you acknowledge problems um, so I wonder if there's something already in place for that um, 
Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that that's great. And that's something we, we would like to develop further because it's not quite there yet. Um, but if, if there's a, a need, and as you expressed it, I, I think there is, um, I think that's definitely something we can work on. Um, I don't know what's available uh, from Solar because I'm, I'm not so familiar with that work, um, but maybe Justin would be to um, know a bit more about that. But then I'm wondering what sort of platform we could use if, if it could um, you know, materialize in the form of that MS Teams or, or something like that. Um, do you have any ideas or, or things or tools that we could use to, to make that possible? Perhaps even um, catch up sessions uh, once a month or something like that, where people could come up, early researchers could come up with, uh, you know, uh, problems or issues that they're facing and discuss them. That's a good idea. So like a, a sort of learning analytics clinic where you can discuss yes. your problem. <laughs> And, and see what solutions there are. Okay. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. I like sharing problems. <laughs> no solutions though. <laughs> um, I guess the the tricky part with this, you know, network being a worldwide network is when to find a time that will suit everybody. So we will also need to think about asynchronous um, sessions, but I, I think that, that could that could work nicely too. Any other ideas or suggestions? I'm taking notes furiously here. <laughs> what we talked about um, graduate student mentorship to and helping graduate students and early career researchers better connect with, with what's out there. I think that was a great conversation that came out of our last partner meeting. And something I definitely want to see if we can do the flesh out. No, that, that sounds good. Um, Lawrence, you were talking about uh, asynchronous kinds of things and something that I haven't heard yet mentioned as a tool is Slack. Um, I know that's become a much more utilized kind of platform um, for several different widely dispersed <laughs> groups that I'm involved with. And it, it has served as a connecting point. Um, I, at first, I was a little bit uh, skeptical, <laughs> but it's actually, um, I, I've, I've now seen it be used to foster good community and connections among people who are also connecting in other like Zoom kind of settings. So it sounds like it might be the kind of, of uh, you know, asynchronous platform that could serve to connect people between the network events that are serving to get people actually connected to each other to, to know each other's work, et cetera. Um, but that, that may be a, a way to, uh, questions were coming up, you know, like how, if I have a question and I wanna ask for advice, that, that could be the kind of platform that if people were connecting to it because you're connecting to Slack for other reasons anyway, because so many things are starting to, uh, you know, groups are starting to connect there, then that potentially could be useful. No, thank you for your suggestion. I think that's a great idea. And I'm actually part of a, another group. So my research background is around mathematical cognition and there's a new ish society around that topic. And they just created a, a new Slack um, channel. So I think that could be indeed a good way. It seems to be getting some traction there where people are introducing themselves and you can ask different questions. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you for your contributions. Um, now I'd like to, um, to see if we can identify capacity um, and move to, to the last part of this brainstorming session because I, I think this network is a great networking opportunity and learning opportunity but it's also a way for you to showcase your work. So we'd like to 
to ask you to share the, the projects that you're already doing and, and do you think that any of these could be translated into a session for the network? So what are you working on and could you perhaps give a presentation or, or a workshop or something a bit more practical maybe? We, we heard from the panelists that practical sessions work best. Um, but yeah, we'd like to, to hear from you and what you do. Um, I'll, I'll go first. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so I've, I've got sort of two hats. I've been doing my PhD in sort of complexity causality in learning analytic systems. It's very broad and abstract at the moment um, and narrowing down. But later on, I'll have hopefully have some stuff about sort of where this kind of gap between the theory and the practitioner sort of arises. That's what I'm honing in on. But anything around that field I'd be really interested in. But in terms of being able to share something, um, my work with Charles Sturt around the retention um, sort of system that we've got might be interesting to share in terms of, it's a bit of an example where we've talked a lot with the, um, the team that's doing the intervention as a result of the analytics. And that's fed back into our design process of our systems. And I think there's some good stories to tell um, in terms of that's completely changed what decisions you've made in terms of like, like steering us away from doing sort of machine learning and looking at sort of simpler rules based things because the, the end result of the model isn't really, um, you know, a, a highly efficient prediction algorithm. The end result is an intervention with the student which centers around a phone conversation. So your product has to be geared towards that. Um, but sort of building that system is, we've probably got some interesting things to share. No, that sounds fantastic. I think it'd be great to have a session on that topic. And uh, I don't think we've touched on that very much yet. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, anybody else? I'll pop back on to say that um, I could potentially, I, I'm interested in finding out more about these equity uh, sessions. And so after that, after I learned a little bit more about what the focus is, there might eventually um, be something that I could add from my dissertation research. Um, but I don't feel like I know yet. <laughs> but I'll think about it. Think that's, about fair, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If, if you can go back to the sessions and see um, what, what's in there for you, obviously, and then and see how you can add on to what's already existing, uh, I think that would be wonderful. So thank you. So say you, you also have the opportunity if you want to collaborate with Georgetown or some of the others that have brought up too. It doesn't need to be one site. It can be multi-site and have people facilitate, co-facilitate sessions too. So. And we can connect you with Yana and her group, so don't hesitate to reach out. So maybe I tell you what I'm doing uh, in my PhD. I started out implementing a modular open source framework for multi-touch learning games for those multi-touch displays, tabletop displays. Uh, well, there is no possibility for user studies uh, in so close uh, environments right now. So I somehow shifted it to implementing the whole research pipeline from planning the experiment until uh, open data publication and uh, gathering all the required metadata and so on. And uh, I'm focusing on the research process itself instead of the, the collaboration. And uh, it's a lot of multimodal learning analytics combined with open data. So maybe if I'm ready someday uh, with my PhD, uh, which should be by the end of the year, maybe I can do something on that. That would be brilliant. Thank you so much. And again, it's a very new topic. I don't think we discussed that in the network previously. So. Um... That would be great and good luck on writing your PhD.
PhD thesis this week or this year. You can do this. Thank you. <laughs> Who else would like to share what they're working on currently and see if uh, if we could maybe help you present something within the network? I'm fairly new um, within my research. I've just, um, my research proposals have been accepted and I'm working on my ethics approval now. Uh, so I'm working um, <laughs> in the primary school, uh, at the primary school level in Australia, uh, Melbourne. Um, and again, looking at um, all different types of data that is available, as I said at the start, structured and some unstructured, for example, things like planning documents, um, term planners, weekly planners, yearly planners, from teachers, what's being taught, how much and how, in addition to performance documents and what, you know, what schools are using for their learning and teaching, uh, plus also effective data. And then uh, feature engineering based on that, um, and ultimately identifying out of all that data what is significant, and then how can that be optimized to improve mathematics learning within primary schools. So it's all really vague at the moment because it's all theoretical. <laughs> Hopefully in a year, year and a half's time when I've started doing some of that stuff, I could perhaps share some of the, you know, some of the um, hopefully achievements, but also problems and how I worked around them or what did I do with them? So like case studies would, perhaps with primary schools. Yeah, I think that would be fantastic. Um, and quite selfishly, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, mathematics anxiety and I'm, I'm doing a lot of research around that topic. So I'd love to hear uh, more about your research and, and you know, once you've connected some data around that, um, yeah, um, share, you know, sharing your experience as well as what it was like collecting different types of data. And yeah, I think that would be great. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Okay, so I have one final question for you. Um, so we're still very mostly Western within this network. So we have a lot of presence in the US and in Australia. It's growing in Europe, but um, not so much the case in South America um, or Asia or Africa. So we'd like to build our capacity worldwide. Um, so I'd like to ask you, what are the potential regions or hub that have not been represented yet, but you would like to see as part of the network? Um, so people or, or labs that you'd like to connect with around the world, um, people who are using uh, cutting edge techniques that you'd like to learn more about or, or colleagues of yours that you think, ah, oh, yeah, I think that would be great to be a part of this network and, and give a presentation. So that's my final question for you. Yeah, I'm not sure who is all in the network on all of the members, but Singapore, definitely Elizabeth Koch from Singapore would be somebody important because they are well, they, they do a good job. They and they are located in a unique position. So, uh, yeah, that would be one. The other would be universities in South Africa. There are people doing learning analytics there. South Africa could be another good place. Uh, Japan as well. There are some 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 labs in Japan that are that are quite active, and uh, some in South Korea as well. If looking just those expanding a bit. Uh, I guess yeah. probably the hardest part would be Middle East and in Africa would be probably the hardest parts to reach out. Latin America is pretty well connected. I mean, you know yeah. who to contact. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had one session, but I think yeah, we'd like to expand exactly. even more. Um, so thank you for sharing. Uh, do, you, do you know people personally in Singapore, um, Japan and South Korea that you could connect us with? I'll, I'll write down the name. Thank you. And in this room, we have our first Japanese. Uh, oh yeah, Felix, please. 
uh, in india we are having a, a large scale uh, mooc platform swayam platform and uh, many faculty members and uh, students are uh, being benefited and they get uh, credit also for their <clears throat> for their university education and uh, in that uh, the indian institute of technology madras and bombay that is iit bombay and iit madras they run a learning analytics group and they conduct a national conference uh, like technology for education and uh, some of the professors uh, i am be i'm keenly following uh, based on on their research publications and uh, they are uh, conducting workshops and uh, webinars just to update uh, how uh, uh, online education is uh, doing and uh, what are the uh, benefits to uh, align the uh, national curriculum uh, along with the uh, online education uh, and uh, this pandemic has uh, uh, given impetus for that movement and uh, i think uh, uh, those professors uh, will be uh, very valuable for this network and uh, they can be much benefited by the interactions and uh, contacts from uh, various people. Wonderful. Um, do you mind dropping in the chat maybe a link to uh, the lab website or, or people we could contact perhaps? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I can. Uh, Professor, one uh, uh, who is a national coordinator is uh, Professor Mangal Sundar. I, I worked under him. He's from IIT Madras. I will share in the chat also. And the other one who is uh, uh, currently uh, uh, currently the uh, uh, lead is uh, lead for the project is uh, Professor Andrew Tangaraj. Uh, Professor Andrew Tangaraj, I will share his link also uh, because they are generating the Indian uh, MOOC platform Swayam. Uh, so I will just uh, type type it in the chat Swayam project and. Uh, uh, because we have a uh, human resource and uh, yeah. we, as a, uh, the Indian mentality is to have an inflation of education, how much certificates I can uh, accumulate. It's not uh, <laughs> focusing on not. <laughs> so this uh, is actually uh, being uh, uh, utilized by the private players and the parents. Uh, they are sapped of uh, school education, especially for K-12 education, online apps, private players of uh, just minting money and uh, for uh, entrance exams into uh, premier institutions like IIT, they, they have a uh, uh, huge support of data and uh, they uh, monthly, it's, it's really uh, sapping. Uh, recently, there is a, a research publication also how uh, they are using and where the public sector of education has lacked. And instead of uh, going to school, they are more focusing on uh, two years uh, later, what entrance to clear and how this two years uh, they are using the learning analytics and uh, uh, showing the parents of the, uh, that how their wards are performing. So this is a, a sector as we uh, discussed and, uh, but the public sector can do much better and they are doing and they have uh, uh, apprehension to share the uh, data also because uh, that may be used against uh, uh, their uh, the image. So that, that is the issue when it comes to data sharing, what's happening behind that uh, MOOC platform. So as researchers, we'll be very happy to uh, update our knowledge, like uh, for uh, problem, uh, for uh, various models for uh, understanding learner, learning analytics and uh, free softwares that can be implemented. And also uh, to show what's happening. So for example, uh, we offered some courses, but we could not get the data. We offered in the Swine platform, uh, I, I was a co-coordinator and uh, I offered uh, two courses uh, since uh, 2018 and 19, and uh, I could not get the data, that's uh, the user data, and could not uh, uh, publish uh, a valuable. Still, I'm trying to publish, uh, but the data is uh, outdated. So they want uh, real-time data where the uh, uh, learning analytics can be fitted and uh, we can give real-time real, uh, real -time interventions and uh, see what's happening, like a live dashboard. So I will share the link uh, uh, of... Uh, thank you. No, brilliant. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing more about your, your context and your experience, because it is very different from country to country. And it's great to hear that there's a hunger for learning more about learning analytics and keeping up to date with the latest trends in India. So, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. 
Um, okay, I think we're just about to close this session. So I'd like to ask you, do you have any final comments, suggestions, questions for us? Okay, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for your contributions. It was great to meet you all, and I will hand it over to George. Hey, thanks all, and uh, Florence, Justin, thanks particularly to you for supporting this and pulling all the details together. I think it's been a really informative session, a lot of great ideas exchanged, and I think some really good potential for our sort of future focus on where we might want to go with technology or with curriculum. And thanks to take up all of you for your suggestions. Certainly some of the ideas of what kind of presentations you want to see or in some cases even offering them. So uh, you know, we're still a very young network, but as was mentioned during the 25 nodes and growing and an interest to become more global. Potential to be a really good resource to onboard people into learning analytics and also to keep people in the field sort of frontline with their skill sets. So, thanks very much, everyone, for your time. I hope you have a great rest of the uh, LAC conference. Thank you for joining and have a nice day or, or good night. <laughs> yes. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully, get some good rest. Take care, all.